life hit me the most when I got to grade nine and I discovered that the life that had changed, the life that has, had become better was going to become worse because those were not my biological parents. So staying there, sometimes we could not eat. There was nothing at home. He told, he said, I was going to, I'm going to talk to those people that transport those minerals if they can pack you behind the truck as they go to Lusaka. It's okay. He said, okay, fine. So that's how he took me there. I was packed in the truck with the, the stones in there. Then we got to Kalomo. You know, by the way, my, my dad has a nickname in that village, you know. It's a very poor family, like the poorest to a point. So my dad has a nickname. They call him, they call him Simaganze. It's it means somebody who just wishes, but never gets anything good. Dad told me there was no rosango for me. Um, he could pay my fees at a government school that was Kamwala Second. He said I'll pay, but the rest of other things like other things that you need you will know how to f to figure out mine is to pay for your fees the other things you know how to figure out that meant i had to to hustle for myself a lot happened to me there were there were moments um i there were moments in my life I spent nights outside. So I could get to Kamuala, sometimes never go to class. Just go by the school grounds and sit. And I have people buying and I'm selling them there. I was really sad. I remember one inst instance where a man told me he would be paying me 10000 a week. That's a fixed amount. But he, he would be providing everything for me. That's if I was just willing to, to, to abide and stay. You know, that, that, that's a sugar daddy. And there were moments that were really hard when it came from the people that I trusted. There are times I don't understand why I have had to go through this, but I don't have to understand anyway. I can't kill myself. I can't. I'm already in this, so I'm in for it. It's time for the big conversations. Telling stories of movers and shakers, of industry giants and daring professionals. It's time for the conversations that change your perspective on life. The kind of conversations that shape entrepreneurs and move careers forward. If you don't know where these conversations are found, we are sending you a GPS. But if you're listening to this voice right now, you are here. Welcome to the Growth Podcast. This is the GPS. All right, welcome. Episode number 41 of the Growth Podcast is here. This uh, is the GPS. Thank you very much for joining us for another exciting um, edition of the podcast. Um, we've uh, we had Tafatwa last week. Um, what a great podcast, that one. What a great podcast. Um, you should go back and watch it. Um, it talks a lot about teams and how you can enhance performance, whether you're in management, or whether you're being led. Um, I feel like it's a must-watch podcast. This week, um, the podcast is taking a different turn. So there is a young lady um, that uh, did reach out to me. I get a lot of people, by the way, who reach out to me to want to be on the podcast. Um, most of them never get the chance because their stories just ain't it. Um, but this week is different. Um, I felt like this is a story that was worth sharing. And so we invited that young lady to come on the podcast. She is here with us on the podcast. Um, and I always tell people that if you see someone on the podcast and you don't know them, uh, pay more attention to those because there is a reason uh, why they are on the podcast. My guest today is Queen Luyando Dube. Um, Queen has an interesting story that we want to get out of her. Um, welcome to the podcast, Queen. Thank you so much, Mr. Soilanji. Thank yeah, you. it's good to have you on the podcast. Um, so what, what made you want to be on the podcast? Okay, what made me want to be on the podcast was uh, when I realized that 
I carried a story that encourages a lot of my peers and people, even older people that I meet. I realized that, okay, this story is worth sharing. At first, I used to hide this story. I used to feel ashamed, like, okay, I am not, I'm not okay. I, I was never okay with everything that happened to me. I was still traumatized. I was still sad about everything. So what I wanted was to hide in inside me. I wanted to hide behind closed doors. But when I realized that whenever I tried to share my story, people came on board wanting to listen. Others opened up or, uh, about how I encouraged them, how I, I changed their perspective about life. And I thought, okay, this is not actually a sad story. This is actually an inspirational story. So I, I, I thought, okay, I would inspire a lot of my peers. I would inspire a lot of people out there that might have gone through what I've gone through or maybe are currently going through what I have gone through and have survived. Let's start from the beginning. What is this story? Let's start from the beginning. Tell us about, you know, where it all starts. Okay, my story starts, starts um, when I was, um, how, how old was I? I think seven. So my parents and I moved from the southern part of Zambia to Lusaka for greener pastures. Um, my dad was into livestock, so he used to to leave us in town, me and mom. I was the only child of my parents. He would go to, to look for livestock to come and sell in Lusaka. So life became hard for me and my mom at some point. We had nothing to feed. The landlord was always on us. You know, things just became sour. And to make everything worse, my mom fell ill. She fell ill to a point she could not even stand or do anything. So I was, I was little then. I think that around that time I was 9, 10. So I decided um, this is a bad situation. In my little mind, I thought, okay, but there was something that I could do. So I went to a certain uncle who I had met the first time we, we relocated so I went and shared with him what was going on at my place. So I told him, say, you know, uncle, we're going through a lot. So I'm asking for some money if I could buy something for my mother to eat. So he gave me a one five, I would say, uh, the old currents, a one quarter fifteen way now. So that was like a one thousand and a five hundred. So he gave me that to get some vegetables and and some. Capamela, milimu, something like that. So I got what I could get. Then I also got plastics, those to my smaller, smaller plastics. Then I got um, a bucket and got some water from the tap, then packed the water in the packets, then took to my landlord's house if she could refrigerate them for me. Then the following day they were frozen. I put them in the bucket and went to the nearest market. I think that is Mutandavantu Market, somewhere in Kanyama. So I, I started selling that. I never thought it would work out, but it worked out. So after that selling, I made some money and got some vegetables. I remember I got impua and rape, got home, cooked for my mom, and that's how we survived. Um, for me, I was, I was a happy child knowing that I was living with my parents and, you know, nothing else mattered, you know. We continued surviving and then I moved to ice blocks so I could buy sweeteners to add into the water and then pack them, go back to the market to resell. Sometimes I, I passed through schools, then I was not in school. I was just home. Um, things changed for my parents. Um to cut the long story short, things changed for my parents. My dad came back and he had made money. After making money, we moved into a bigger space and I was later enrolled in, in school. Um, I started uh, my school in grade two. There was nothing like preschool, nothing. So I just started in grade two. And I was so smart. I remember the first time I was I I I I was the first position in my class. 
So there was that jubilation. This girl is smart. You know, I was able to read. I don't know how, but I was able to read even <laughs> going to school, spending. So, yeah. But then life hit me the most when I got to grade nine. And I discovered that the life that had changed, the life that has, had become better was going to become worse because those were not my biological parents. Um, you know, <laughs> things get tough in life, Swilange. <laughs> they do. Um, you know, because I, I started school late, so there was that skipping of grades at school. And because I was bright, so I did my grade 7 when I was in grade 5. I wrote my grade 7 exams and I scored 750, I remember. Then um, in my grade 8, I was taken to this private school. You know, Dad was always proud of me. You know, I was taken to this pr private school and Dad promised me if I, if I pass my grade 9, he was going to take me to a very nice school, Rusangu. You know, I had always dreamed of being at Lusango, I was always receiving awards at school, best student in all the subjects, including mathematics and sciences, which people think are not uh, for, for girls. But then I was um, diagnosed of uh, low BP for some reason. At what age was that? Uh, I think I was 13. That was 2013. I was in grade 8. So sometimes I could not wake up. I could not do... Most of the things. So what happened was my parents only had me as I was growing up. But 20, um, at some, I don't know, at some point, my young brother came through. I, I have a little brother from that family. I love them so much. So my young brother came through. So we were the two of us. So there was that talking, not, not because my parents were bad. They were good people, you know. Whatever it is that I was going through in the house, I thought was normal. Whatever it is that was happening to me in the house, for me it was okay. I was living with mom and dad. So um, getting to a point where stories started coming up, you know, she's sick, she needs to be at her parents' house. You know, we can't always be keeping somebody who is in this condition. What if she dies? Then what are my parents then what's going on you know it was it wasn't an easy thing for me to get i don't know how i reacted but i was traumatized i was hit so when, when they was when they were saying she's sick she has to be at a parent's house you are hearing that yeah yeah you know where um, mom is talking to somebody in my hearing and i'm confused um i can't figure out what what is it that mom is talking about so um at some point, um, I think after my exams, uh, because my grade nine, I did it at home. I never went to school. I did a self-study. I, I was just at home. They never even spent any money for my school fees. I never attended any class. I remember my school told them not to pay anything because I was never attending class. But then after my exams, I was taken to southern province. You know, I went to Southern Province to meet my parents. Okay, you're jumping a lot. Um, yeah, it's a bit all over the place. Um, so at what point do they actually tell you that they are not your parents? And how did you then find yourself in that family? That's what I'd like to know. Um, how I then found myself in that family, the... Uh, I found out later, so I'm trying to to push the story to a point where I I, I started asking questions okay. that what happened, okay? Because I also didn't know, so I I found I I just accepted there was nothing like people sit me down and tell me we are not your parents this and that. No, I just accepted because everyone was talking about it. You know, this auntie comes and says, you know, you, need, you really need to to get to to visit your parents. You you know, we need to take her to her parents' place. You know, yeah, you know, we're not really dialecting everything at me. So I just started accepting, like, okay, all right. So um, 
the time I was done with my exams, grade nine exams, then I was, uh, my dad told me, okay, it's okay, you can go, um, you can, you can go, you can go to, to your parents' house, that's where you'll meet your mom and dad, I said, okay, it's fine, then I was traveling with, um, a certain aunt that I had visited, so we got to intercity, traveled, and went, and then I got home. I couldn't accept that. You know, I got to a house, a thatched house. You know, where you look at people and you can tell, okay, these are poor people. These guys are poor. You know, I look at my dad, he can't walk properly. His leg looks, you know, it felt like there was something happening to me that I could not even comprehend. Like I couldn't understand. I couldn't. But then I I told myself, okay, if this is where I belong, Lord, I will try. You know. So I stayed there, but life wasn't friendly. Life wasn't friendly. And the, the siblings I found there were not, you know, they were not really not that they were not welcoming, but they didn't know me. And, you know, I looked, you know, there's a difference when somebody's coming from Lusaka and then they they go to the village. Just the way I was looking, they thought I just couldn't be part of them. So staying there, sometimes we could not eat. There was nothing at home. Sometimes, you know, my dad walks sometimes, sometimes he doesn't because uh, according to him, he was involved in an accident in a train. So that left him like that. So sometimes he has a lot of pain. He has some metals, so sometimes he has a lot of pain. He has to crawl. So that situation really, really hit me hard. But then I was hopeful that um, after my results come out, my dad in Lusaka would come to get me. So that I got to school. So after results came out, you know, I could hear people in that village saying results are out, results are out. So I had written a certain number for one teacher from my school. So I called to find out. They told me, you know, you really passed. We never thought you would make um, us proud because you were never attending class. So I got 477 marks just from self-study. So I was so happy. I was so happy. But then Days were moving and nothing, I couldn't hear anything because it's difficult to, even me making that call, I had to climb a mountain because it's really, really in the deep, deep. So it's difficult to get through. So I was I was there and then my dad was telling me, okay, I'll take you to a mine. Uh, there are people that transport, um, you know, Kariba Munlos, they are situated in southern province uh, after Mamba, yeah, so he told, he said, I was going to, I'm going to talk to those people that transport those minerals if they can pack you behind the truck as they go to Lusaka. It's okay. He said, okay, fine. So that's how he took me there. I was packed in the truck with the, the stones in there. Then we got to Kalomo. That truck had issues. So the police held it and we were there like three days I was so hungry I remember I didn't even have shoes on we were so hungry um till a certain woman noticed that okay um there's a problem this girl is alone so she asked me who are you with I said I'm alone and she was like okay what what's what's the story how did that woman find you you were with her she she was one of the workers Oh, for the, from, for company. Yeah, so she was seated in front of the truck. So, but then when the truck was held, I came out. I came out. I was tired staying in there. So she started asking me questions. So I, the, that's how one man said, you know, this is the daughter of uh, that man. You know, by the way, my, my dad has a nickname in that village. You know, it's a very poor family, like the poorest to a point. So my dad has a nickname. They call him... They call him Simaganze. It's it means somebody who just wishes, but never gets anything good. That's what it means. 
Like it's it's a very funny nickname. So Osaman so, so said, okay, this is the daughter of uh, Mr. Simaganze. He asked if we could transport her together with the stones because she's supposed to go to school um, at her uncle's place. So that's how they took me to the bus station and they started contributing money. This one pays something. Then they talked to the conductor. Then they put me on the bus. I got I got to Lusaka that was like 20, but I didn't have bus fare to get to my place. That was in McCain. Um, I, <laughs> Lord, but God made a way. Um, there was a certain woman that I was with on the bus that was heading the, the, the same direction as I, but she had a lot of kids and bags, so I offered to help. So when we got to the bus, she boarded the bus, then I remained. She was like, but where are you going? I said, I'm going to the same destination, but I do not have money. And she was like, okay, come. It's okay. Uh, since you've helped me, you can sit here. You can actually put one of my kids on your laps. Then I'll pay. That's how I got home, somewhere 21. I got home. I knocked at the gate. Mom came. She was shocked to see me, so she told me to wait there. And then she went inside for some time. I was standing out. Then she came back and told me to come in. Um, the following morning, um, Dad asked me how much money I was given to contribute towards my school fees. I was too confused. I was too hurt about everything. Like I just needed somebody to to come me and told me. This, this this wasn't happening, but how can I come with money? I actually did not have any money for transport. I had nothing. So I, I said nothing. I said nothing, not even books, not even a pen. You know, according to, it's not that dad is a bad person. You know, things happen. This is going to be on media. He might watch this. It's not like he's a bad person, but there was a conflict going on um, between that family and my my biological parents, you know, where they were saying you got our child, and then he was also saying, but I was I just did that um, to help you. You couldn't feed the child. You couldn't do. You know, you don't have to paint me black. You know, your family is hunger stricken, but I came there to help. It's not like and what what really amazed me was that these were siblings actually. Yeah. These were siblings. That that dad was my mother's uh, brother. You know where you go to your sister because she can't feed her, her children and she has quite a lot of kids and you get one, then you relocate from that place, you understand? So, um, you know, there was that conflict. So he also... Um, because she was, she was also saying, "No, that's my child." That's so he also wanted to just let go, and there was a lot of talking. You, you got her not because you couldn't feed her. You got her because you didn't have children at your place uh, with your wife. What? So all those arguments really hurt me. I was heartbroken. I, you know, I just couldn't wait for them to resolve the issues and let me be. But then, that didn't happen easily. So. Dad told me there was no Rosango for me. Um, he could pay my fees at a government school that was Kamuala Second. He said, I'll pay. But the rest of other things, like the other things that you need, you will know how to, f to figure out. Mine is to pay for your fees. The other things, you know how to figure out. <sighs> That meant I had to to hustle for myself. You know, my girl child. I need lotions. I need I need pads. I need I need all that. And I was like, okay, how is it even going to be possible? You know. Um, whew. One thing I did not want to do was to give up. I didn't want to. Because I... Uh, okay. 
I told myself I was going to be fine. You know. Get some tissue. I told myself I was going to be okay. How? I did not know. I did not really know how, but I just promised myself however it was going to be, I would be fine. You know, it wasn't easy for him as well to take care of everyone because he's like the only person that is doing well in the entire family and there were other, that time there were other children at home, other dependents that had come through. So he had quite a lot of responsibilities. So I needed to stand for myself. A lot happened to me. There were there were moments um I there were moments in my life I spent nights outside. You know where you are in the same yard then you, you go to maybe watch TV in the next door. And then by as early as 18 or 19, the doors are locked and you have to be outside. For him, that was discipline. Why? Because he believed my family, uh, my me and my other siblings were just like that we were we had that wayward behavior but then one thing that he forgot is that i didn't grow up with my parents he raised me but he always had that he always had that anger in him because every one of my my siblings in the village were maybe falling pregnant as early as grade 7 so he always thought i would also end up that way he was so hard on me you know, there were moments I was, you know, I, there were moments I was really, really beaten for, for no proper reasons. That if I would tell you some of the reasons, you would think I'm lying. Tell me. You know, reasons like we were trying to wake up so that you could eat. But you were pretending to be asleep. What do you mean? Just that. Like trying somebody is trying to wake you up so that you wake up and have dinner. But then you are fast asleep and somebody starts beating you while it's you're in your sleep you are in your sleep and yeah. I don't want to go to mention that. But yeah. Well, according to him, he said, we are, we are in good terms now. According to him, he said, it's because he didn't want me to drag my other siblings. So, I was ever traumatized. The, this, who, who, who was your relative? Is dad, it the man or the woman? Dad, that was mom, my biological mother. Or your biological mom, mother, mom. that's the brother. Yeah. Yeah, so he's 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 quite a very tough man, and everyone knows him like that. But did he treat you like that before you moved back to when you found your your real parents? Was it like that also before that? Was that changed after you found out about your real parents? Um, I would say things were almost the same, but I began to see to feel the difference after I noticed because. This was me growing up and thinking these are my parents. So whatever it is that I went through, I didn't think it was wrong. Okay? I didn't feel that was wrong. Because I remember even before that, I think at 11, I, there, were, there were moments I was like locked, locked outside. But then I could just sit. Locked outside? Where were you coming from? <laughs> Where was I coming from? I was just in the same phase. Not not even after twenty. I mean, that's you know where those are compounds. You 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 do play games outside. You know where parents are inside the house, and you can hear the kids playing games outside. 
you know, doing those to make a bisha, bisha and all that. And the, the time just comes, you know, it's in a fence. I'm not outside the friends, and I'm playing with other neighbors' kids. And, you know, there are just moments where I tell oh, guys, you know, let everyone go. When you get home and the door is locked and, you know. And you spend the night outside. Yeah, but, yeah, well, yeah, I do try to, to knock and. They're not open for you. No, but I can hear voices inside. And you actually sleep outside. Yeah, the whole night to somewhere six when they they wake up too. Yeah, but then uh, after grade 12. Um, how did you, tell me, how did you fend for yourself? Because you said you only paid for, for, for your, your school fees. How did you, all these other things like you mentioned, your pads, your lotion, your other things, other needs, how did you meet those needs? Um, you know, I thank him also because he said he would, be paying for my transport fare because that was far. You get to town uh, on a bus, then from town you get on another on another oh, bus. To bus. Yeah, to Kamwara. So what happened was I used to walk. I would walk the first the first few weeks. I walked from Straight Maken to Kamwara, and then I I had saved up some money, so I used to order a few things like freezes. Yeah. To sell, to sell at school and some ribbons, hair ribbons in Kamwara, just there in the Kamwara market. So I was always selling, you know, I was taken back to that life, you know. So I was used to, to, to sell. But then I just did not want to accept my situation that time. So I could get to Kamwara, sometimes never go to class, just go by the school grounds and sit. You know, of people buying and I'm selling, I'm there. I was really sad. I can't explain I, I can't explain what I was feeling. I can't. I can't tell you what was going on, but there's this in me that has helped me move on and carry on, believing that I'm human. Okay, so And what about uh, your your aunt, his wife? What what how's 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 the relationship with her? You know, I would, you know, it was, you know, what I do not want is to say those people are bad. I really, I'm really trying so hard to to run away from that. So I would say my relationship with both of them was okay. It's just that I did not, it was just a situation where I wasn't okay with what was going on with me. Okay. I wasn't okay with a few things that were done to me. Not that they're bad people, but I wasn't just okay with a few things that were done to me. You know, um, my relationship with mom, I still see her as my mom, even at you now. You know, my relationship with mom is always okay. There's ne- There was never a time we could, we could just go on without talking, no. But... It was just a life, normal life. I have some money. I get myself lotion. I get some my, myself pads, and I do some house chores. Next morning, I go to school. There are other people in the house that he has to take care. You know, he has to he has to provide for for everyone, and it's not easy when you're in business. So he was trying. Just that, you know, it wasn't easy for me as well. So after you finished Kretov. Yeah, after after I finished grade twelve, um, I was um, I, I I asked him that I needed I wanted to apply for I wanted to apply go to college or something. Then he told me there was no money. So according to him, it was like grade twelve was where he could end with helping me. So I needed to go home. Mm, the village, my parents' house. But then I, I thought of what I saw and how difficult it was for me to come to Lusaka. And whatever it is, what, what goes around in that village, almost everyone of my age is married. Or maybe they have two kids or so. I, at that point, I think I was, I was like 
17, 18. But that time, even somebody who is 13, 14 in that village, they are married. So I didn't want to go back. I was scared. So I thought, now this is the time I need to to do something for myself. I can't lie to you. I don't know where that courage came from. Even until now, I don't know. But I just said, okay, I'll try. So I went to to my former school, Kamala Secondary, and I talked to this um, there's this woman that um, was so good to me. She was working under the career and guidance. Yeah, the counselor. Yeah. So uh, there was one point I, I was I, I was I had sustained some injuries, like internal injuries from the beating, the room and all that, and I had missed school for like three months, like that. And she noticed that, so she helped me get to the hospital and all that. So we had that rapport with her. So I went back to her and I told her, um, this is what is happening to me. So she said she was going to help me. Um, just with application fees, but I needed to to visit a number of offices for help. So um, she applied for me um, two schools that was Levi Mwanawasa and I don't even remember the other one. Is it Eden? But because Levi Mwanawasa went through is what I I was left with. So, but then there were fees to pay to be paid. So I went back home and he told me, you know what, uh, I went back to my dad. This time he explained to me, he said, you know, I want you to understand that I really want you to go to school. And I would have loved to help, but I can't at this point. Because I'm paying for, there was somebody who was paying for. So he said, I can't, there is there is no money and I can't tell you that I would pay you this year or that other year. So there's no money. For me, you, I think you can just go home and stay. So it was the same old story. So I started going through offices. Um, I would walk from McKen to Chawama, Looking for Tasila Lungi's office, I had no. She would, she can help. The, the MP. Yeah, but then, you know, sometimes it was, it, you know, it was not successful. I went to visit also the minister in Chawama, who sent a letter to Levi Mwanawasa. Then I also went to social welfare. I went to. Um, the DC's office, you know, I went to Fawez. I was constantly walking, you know, I had lost weight. Sometimes I, I would walk barefoot. I remember there was this one time I I was so hungry and thirsty, so I was looking for where Faweza offices were. So I, I I was so thirsty, I just couldn't wait to, to get my hands to any bottle of water. So I saw a pipe that was coming out outside from a fence into a drum. There was some something like a drainage. So I just grabbed that pipe and drank the water. And then this man was running, please, please, that water is coming straight from the toilet. And I had already drank. I was like, gosh, please. I just couldn't hold myself. I was so thirst. So he, he came, he was like, I was like, I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know, but I was just super thirsty. So what happened was I, I when when after so many trials uh, of wanting to get help and I did not from these offices, uh, I, I went back home and I said, uh, I remember that morning I prayed. I said, God, today, if it doesn't work out, I'm never going to try this. Because I was getting tired, like physically. I was getting tired emotionally. So I remember that day I went to the DC's office. And every time I went there, I couldn't see the DC because, uh, you know, there's well, there's a guard there, the secretary, and they would tell me, you know, there are other important people that the DC has to see. And what about this child? So that day, 
Uh, because I told myself I was not going to try again. And you know, I know myself. Whatever I tell myself, I do. So I knew if that day would not work out, I was never going to try again. So I said, today, I have to do everything possible. So the DC was going out and there was a guard and then, uh, his driver. So they opened the, the door to the Hilux and closed the door. So I rushed there. They tried to stop me. I said, no, don't stop me. I, I struggled with them and went straight to the back window where he had sat and I knocked. So he, he lowered the window and... You know, I you know I I didn't know what his his reaction would be, but then I just thought ah, I I will be fine. Then he said, "What's the problem?" And then um, that man said, "Explain." You know, this child has been coming here, but you know. Then he said, "No, no, no, enough. It's okay." He told the driver to hold. Then he he stopped the car and came out. Then he just held my hand and said, "Follow me to the office." Then I explained to him whatever it is that I was going through. Then he said, okay, I'm going to direct a social welfare to help you with, um, you know, there's, there's a way these things go. But then I think you really need help. But uh, as we are trying to, to, to finalize how your scholarship would be, I'll just uh, direct the social welfare to at least pay your first school fees so that you can start going to school. I was so excited. I was super, super excited, and I went back home, and I told everyone that, okay, finally I found school, but they didn't believe me. That was what shocked me. Actually, according to them later, he testified that he actually thought I just left home to go and stay somewhere, and but then I went into school, and then what happened also was, uh, you know, these official things really are difficult. There are different people in these offices. At some point, my scholarship did not go through, and I had to find a way to survive in school. So I had a number of people helping me out. Then, then there, you know, it's it's just that. Um, you know, when I'm telling the story like this, sometimes I wish it was a movie. Sometimes I wish it was just a, a story in the book. But it's true. You know, where you're in school and I, I had to survive, you know, 60 seconds of a minute, 60 minutes of an hour, 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week, 30 days in a month, surviving. I need to eat. I need to pay my boarding fees. I need to do this and that. Even when people are helping here and there, you know, they can help with fees, but what about other needs? And it's not, you know, it's not always um, that my, my uncle would have enough to help me. Sometimes he could send money sometimes, but business was not okay. You know, business was not going well. So it's... It was tough for me. I've been in situations where I met I met men that were offering huge amounts of money. You know, they would take care of me. They would do that for me. They would rent an apartment for me. And really, it's not. It's very very difficult to say no to such things when you are in need. You know, this is me leaving my boarding house. I have not eaten anything, you know. It's it's very possible that I can fall for even a meal. And this is a man that tells me, I remember one inst instance where a man told me he would be paying me 10000 a week. That's a fixed amount. But he, he would be providing everything for me. That's if I was just willing to 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 abide and stay you know that, that that's a sugar daddy that's a blazer and you know i would i would always think to myself okay is there any other better way i i can i can use apart from this you know i did not want to to lower myself to to that point this is what i told you at first like there's this driving force in me that has been here believing that i'm human you know, I can be in the scorching sun and somebody is offering a ride. But if they don't talk to me in 
a polite way, I will not accept. You know where somebody just stops saying, like a, like that time I was I was selling salaola jewelry. Then this this guy just stops. You know, anyway, like an pere kwa mina wenda. You know, like he's speaking to some trash. And I was like, no, thank you, sir. I mean, I left home. I left my boarding house, going out to look for means of survival. I had no idea I was going to meet you. I didn't plan to meet you, so. I will go with what I planned to sell and get some money and get back home. But really, getting to a point where I have to be, you know, treated anyhow just for survival, I said no. And there were moments that were really hard when it came from the people that I trusted. You know, there are people that are willing to help. Let's say this woman loves you and she wants to help you. She helps you actually. She's there for you, and the husband just doesn't agree. It has to be free. And the husband behind the back is trying to to make advances at you, and it's really tough. It, eh, you know. There are times I don't understand why I have had to go through this, but. I don't have to understand anyway. What 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 uh, medical school were you at? Uh, Levi Manawasa. Did you complete? Yeah, I completed my my nursing and midwifery, but um, I'm still doing medicine. Something that I don't want to to talk about due to to some conflict that it might bring from my uncle's side, but I'm still doing medicine, you know. Um, you know where he has a lot, lot of questions, so I'm really trying so hard to to filter what I can give out. But yeah, I'm still doing medicine, but I completed my nursing school. So you're doing medicine to become a doctor? Yeah. Where? Levy. At Levy? Yes. Who's paying for that? Um, I am. You're paying for yourself? Yes. You have a job? No. Um, <laughs> okay, so this is what happened. Um, second year university in nursing. I met um, a childhood friend that had become overweight. So she shared with me how it, how it was affecting her and how depressed she was. She's actually older than me. She was telling me, you know, it's even difficult for me to maintain a relationship because everyone is talking about my weight. I really need help. So I started researching about that. Um, after the researching, I I discovered there are actually health ways than everything that is being shown on social media about losing weight. So I told her, you know, we could try a few things. So we tried the first, uh, it did not work. The second worked just a bit, but then she really wanted to lose weight because she was overweight. So the third one, after my research, worked, you know. And there was no, there were no health um, effects like bad side effects. She actually had good effects. She she lost the BP. The BP was no longer high. It was coming back to normal. So after that, I had a number of people coming to me for that. And then I was told, you know, you can actually make this, you know, this can actually be a business. This is actually expensive. People are struggling with weight. So that's how I, I actually launched my first business. Um, I call it the QD Healing Aid. It's a health shop. It's now registered. So um, that, we're trying to work against the 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 social media ways of losing weight. People don't actually lose weight after that, after paying a lot of money. You know, others end up having, you know, excessive, like, you know, severe diarrhea, which is not so good, you know, as a way of uh, losing weight. So there, there are better ways of losing weight, there are better health ways of losing weight that I discovered. So that's how I started with the business. And it has really helped me. Um, I'm grateful to God. It has really helped me. And um, 
I also discovered something uh, through the same researches. I I kept on discovering, you know, other ways of health living. To a point, I I grew my hair with some remedies that I was researching, and people are like, I remember the deputy registrar was like, your hair has grown at Levi Manawasa. So what did you do? Because I know you. This is not how your hair is. Then I said, okay, this is what I'm doing. And then people started buying, you know. It's just that um, the picture of this business is blurred and big. And I cannot, I cannot afford to get most of the ingredients, most of uh, the machinery I need to make some of these products, you know, to run the business, actually. I remember the time I was doing some registrations, I had to put my other researchers on hold because Zamla was requesting for too much. You know where you discover something that is actually uh, a therapy, something that heals? Like you need to pay about 35000 just for registering. I was like, gosh, that's too much. And then I had to put that on hold because I I don't have much. But then I've been, you know, I I work hard. I work so hard. I'm proud of that. I work so, so, so hard. Like when it comes to hard work, I really think I do try. It's just that it's not easy because whatever I find, I need to share between me and my family in the village. Oh, so you're taking care of them now? Yeah, they depend on me. It's just that certain things are hard, Mr. Suilanji, because, you know, where I'm still struggling and I have these younger siblings, you know, I keep telling them, please, I, I, I begged them, please hold on, like, carry on. Things will be better one day. But eh, things were, I keep being hit. You know, I heard there was this man that was helping them at some point. You know, when things were really tough for me, I was just trying to survive out here. And things were really tough for me. I couldn't afford providing everything for them. Um, Because, you know, my mom is a sickler. She's ever sick. She has low BP. I think that's where I got it from. She has low BP and she's anemic. So she can't farm. Farming. She cannot, she can't, she cannot, she can't even lift a bucket, she'll get sick. Even the way she looks, you can see, by the way, the the paleness and everything. So it's tough. So there was this man that was helping my sisters, you know, give them food they take home. This old man, he's actually older than my uncle. Whatever happened, he ended up marrying my young sister. And that was for free, just like that. I'm sure because he was helping them out. And that's how my young sister got married. You know, I was broken. You know, I'm trying so hard to make my family better, but it seems like I'm being pulled back by this strong force, poverty. You know, before I could even accept that, my other little, little sister, she actually came to Lusaka. I invited her over. She was at uncle's place. So I, I had some money. I bought her a school bag. That was after she wrote grade 7. I bought her a school bag. I bought her a few things, you know. Uncle also got her a uniform. She went back home. Eh, whatever happened, she also fell pregnant, you know. Eh. I felt like, hey, there's nothing I can do. Yo. Mm. <laughs> she fell pregnant and mm. <laughs> whatever, but that hit me. How can I be trying and things are going sour? And you know, I just a few weeks. I was going through a lot, Mr. Swilland. You know, I'm, um, I'm trying to grow my business. So I found um, 
because my clients mostly want to meet me physically not online so i'm always meeting them maybe at a restaurant and eating place like that but then most of them like okay we really, you really need to find a place it's not you know most of them are go to do so there's that so i found a, a place my 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 room i tend it into an office i said now i will be squatting with friends i think i need to 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 change this i'm trying to grow it so i bought a few things like shelves i did some registrations i'm trying to i'm trying so hard to make my business grow and then a few weeks i just received a call um your father has been arrested because he owes a certain man man some money so the man said says he needs to pay him and you know my dad he can't take off his shoes because of those metals and and you know it it, it air hasn't the air does not have to to go through the wounds and all that and i was there panicking what do i do now he doesn't have to sleep in the police cells so that's me now getting the cell money that i had to but then i asked him what did you use the money for you know you've not been calling we needed to to buy some food then i promised them that whenever you call and send us money i would give them i guess Oh this is sad then I had to send some money and then yeah just a week later somebody beats him up exactly on the same leg you know where uh, people make you know <laughs> people are poor <laughs> not if I'm telling you that my my parents are poor you think it's a story you know if I was to take you home <laughs> yo <laughs> You know why I don't I no longer get offended even when people are making fun of him because that's true. You know, I've just learned to to be strong and believe one day I'm going to make it. One day my business will grow. I will have funds one day to grow my business and I'll build my parents a house, a decent home, you know. I can't kill myself. I can't. I'm already in this, so I'm in for it. So somebody beat him up and they were making fun of him because and they, I think they are the other the same issues of maybe begging for food or anything maybe I don't know I didn't even want to go in 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 details but then he, they he was beaten on the same leg and then there was need for transport rushing him to the hospital I was like guys what do I do I'm going to I felt like what okay If you don't want me to try just kill me you know I'm trying but it seems like the more I try I I'm drawn, I'm just pushed back but then when I look at um other kids on the street there is one that I talked to that told me you know my dad was an arm robber and we did not know so he, after he was he was shot and um the police came and got away with everything because everything he had was you know was achieved through robbery there was nowhere i could stay that's how i ended up in the streets but somebody told me of your story ali kosom guys wa ku church So somebody knows knew about my story from church and went and encouraged that person and that person left the street because they heard about my story they couldn't wait to meet me so they told me actually I'm fine I way you 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 make people realize that there are better ways of survival than actually just being on the street and doing other wrong things like the way I went on the streets and nazo jump around onto my phone But then after they told me at mkazi zao na ngakuchimfe bwanje no she had options of doing all that that, she, that you are doing but she changed i i couldn't wait to meet you I was like okay then i need to carry on like there's hope i know i haven't made it yet but if i couldn't give up then not now It's okay if I would die but I want to die strong. If I give up now, you know, if I wanted to 
the funny thing is that if I wanted to make my life better, I would. God is my witness. I would. But not the right way. I would. There's so many, many of these men that tell me, you know, I'm pretty, you know, all I need is just proper care. And if I chose to go that way, I would just start with that, that one that one I wanted to 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 mention his job, but then his occupation. But then I, no, I would just start with that one, and then he would give me a hundred and thirty thousand, and obviously my business would would just grow, and I will I will invest it. But whatever will come out, whatever time that I will die, I will not I will not die strong. I will die as a weak person because I gave in to wrong vices. But I want to die strong. If it means I'll die trying, I'll be proud of myself because I would have died strong. How are you doing right now? How are you right now? I'm fine. I'm fine. Your business is able to take care of you, take care of your school fees and everything? Um, yes. Uh... You know, Mr. Suilanj, I'm okay. The fact that I'm surviving each day that comes, you know, I'm able to to pay my renters, to get some food. Of course, I get to have challenges. I get to have challenges, but I do a lot of planning instead of breaking down and self-pity. There are moments I get hit, so <laughs> though, you know, moments where, especially social media, you know, where you, you're going through so much, a very tough situation, you know, where I know where I can take my business with proper funding. I can picture that. The same way I envisioned where I am now, then, is the same way I envision where I can be. And then I'm here... Okay, I need I need some money and who can help me? And you know, nobody, nobody. Nobody can just come and help you. And then okay, let's say for example, I need some money. I'm having a very tough time. I get broken most of the times. I'm having a very tough time and maybe I, I even need money for food that time, maybe things are not okay. And then you go on social media, you see people posting and you're like, you know. Am I even ever going to be successful? I mean, people are already living their dream lives. I think what is left for me now is just to give up. But then I'm like, no, no, I will be fine. And I'm going to make it one day. And I have some people that inspire me on social media that keep me going. Who inspires you on social media? Um, on social media, I would say... There's one that inspires me a lot. When this celebrity actually is speaking of their story, I feel like they are talking about me. And the power of inspiration, we should never underestimate the power of inspiration. Um, his name is Dumisani. You know, he mentions about how he, he, he was born in a thatched house. He lived, you know, he was from a poor family such that the poor called them poor. That's according to him. But then he kept fighting till he built a big house for his parents. And, you know, there are moments, even the time I went to visit my parents recently, there were moments I just felt like, I can't do this. This is too much. I just want to give up. But a line through my head would say, but Dumisan did. I can do it. Have you met him? No. Have you tried? <sighs> Let me call him for you. I hope <sighs> he picks up. I hope he picks up.
I'm sure it's busy. Maybe he'll come back. Okay. <sighs> yeah. So yeah. he inspires you. Who else inspires you? Um. Who do you want to be like? He has called back. <laughs> My leader. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? I am very fine. You are live on the podcast. Where? How? <laughs> so, long story short, um, I'm uh, here with a young lady. Her name is Queen. Um, oh, Queen, okay. Queen has a very emotional story, Dumisani. Um, I think you would like to hear it yourself in person. Um, but she relates to what you say that uh, you are so poor that the poor called you poor. Uh, she she has quite an emotional story. I think um, when you're free, I'd like you to to meet with her. But for now, I, I I just want her to say hi to you. Just hold on. Okay. Hello. Hi, Queen. How are you? I'm okay. How are you, sir? I'm I'm very well. What? I'm very... I can't believe I'm talking to him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> My leader, uh, we'll talk properly. We'll make a follow-up properly. Okay, my leader. All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, no, no, don't, 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 don't. Yeah, no, don't worry, it's fine. Um, you, you meet with him. You, you meet with him. Don't worry about it. Why don't you meet with him? Yeah, no, don't worry. It's, it's going to be okay. I, I feel like you, you you have lived the life that most people cannot even begin to imagine for themselves um and and my hope is that your example inspire other young women um to 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 embrace working hard because like you said you you had a lot of you know a lot of options to you know engage in relationships and date men for money but you've chosen the higher road and i don't think that god is just going to watch you like that i feel like he always show up for you um yeah um it's, it's, it's a lot for me i think i'm even getting a headache just thinking about you know what what you've been through but i'm also grateful that you reached out and and came to the podcast because for me the whole idea is through your story through your life there are other people that will learn something. And like you said in the beginning, there are others who are living through exactly what you've been through. But the fact that you picked yourself up, I feel like you're on the right path. I don't know if you'd like to say anything before we, we close the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much. Just thank you for, for giving me a platform to share my story. It also gives me strength. It hasn't been easy, but it gives me strength that I can talk about what I went through. Okay. Yeah. No, please, please reach out if you need anything. We'll, we'll arrange so you can, you know, have a conversation with Dumisani and, and see how it goes. Wow. Grateful. Yeah. But the business is okay. If it's fine, it's, it's progressing, it's moving. Yeah, it's, it's promising. It's just that um, there are a number of things that I need that I can't do because I don't have the funding. But I know where to get them. I know what I need, but then I'm just waiting to have enough funds that I can get, especially the ingredients. Others are, you know, I have to import them from outside, then that's a lot and I can't afford. Okay. And in Osaka, you are alone, apart from that uh, family in McKinney. Do you have other family elsewhere? I'm alone. You're alone? Yeah. I'm staying. I'm staying alone, actually. All right, Queen. No, thank you. Um, 
yeah thank you for coming on the podcast um we will be in touch thank you thank you we'll so in much touch. But everything's I'm, i'm happy you've ended the podcast smiling everything's gonna be okay <laughs> i'm grateful thank you so much oh, you're welcome. thank you